Today is October 30th, 2024. I am pleased to be here at the clubhouse of the Littleton Equine Center. Medical Center. Medical Center. Littleton with, Equine Medical Center. With one of the, uh, the principals that has been involved in this place for many years, Dr. Marvin Beeman. Marvin has one of the longest histories involved associated with the area that came to be called Highlands Ranch. So welcome to you, Marvin. Thank you. Today we'd like to cover a number of things that are important in terms of your career as a veterinarian and how your involvement with Highlands Ranch and horses in particular have influenced your career over how many years? 91. 91. <laughs> um, Marvin, you were born in the early 30s, weren't you? Yes. 19, Which year? 1933. 1933. And not speaking of the hospital, but when you were born, where did your family live? In Sedalia. In Sedalia. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, at some point, um, Lawrence Phipps III didn't he um, build uh, a small stone house for your family? Uh, no, he did not build that. I think that house came with a homestead. I don't know the history, but he did not build it. It was. It but was you a, did live there at some point. Oh yes. 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 When did you move there? When I was a year old. Uh huh. My dad went to work for Mister Phipps in 1929. Was going to so, stay two weeks and left 56 years later. <laughs> so tell me about your dad. Well, my dad was born in Sedalia and grew up on a ranch. And in 1929, when Mr. Phipps leased the south part of the Diamond Cave, which was the previous name of Highlands Ranch. That was owned by Frank Kistler. That's right. That's right. And a friend of my dad was working there in 1929. And he called my dad and said, we need some help down here. Would you come and help us for a couple of weeks? My dad went there and looked at the situation, and you got to remember, he was raised on a ranch, yep. so he didn't know what an English saddle looked like or what a hound looked like or anything. And he looked around, and he said, well, this Louis Oxham was this man's name. He said, well, I'll come help you for a couple of weeks, and I'll help you with the horses, but I don't want anything to do with those damn dogs. <laughs> Well, well, at that point, uh, these English fox hounds, how many were associated with what became the hunt club? How many hounds? Yeah. Oh, not very many. I, I, I have no idea about the number, but enough that I think Mr. Phipps had been to England, and, and his father, L.C. Phipps, had started the hunt actually in 1903, and they hunted where the Denver Country Club is today. And then it was disbanded in 19, what, 15 during World War One, And then Mr. Phipps, Elsie Phipps Jr. started it back in 1929. Yeah, my understanding was that um, Lawrence Phipps II and Frank Kistler were neighbors in the country club area of Denver. I suspect that's right. I don't know that. And I suspect that... Uh, Lawrence Phipps II was probably the master of foxhounds. Well, actually, L.C. Phipps originally was the first master. Yes. Then L.C. Phipps Jr. was the master all the time that I was associated with mm -hmm. him in the, on Highlands Ranch. Well, eventually the two of them, his neighbors, got together, and, yeah. Yeah. and Phipps asked Kessler, can we move the hunt club yeah. out to the property on yeah. the south, yeah, you called it the South Ranch, or the South, south Ranch, yeah, the South Ranch. Uh -huh. So that's how it got started. That's how it got started. Yeah. So at some point, uh, you ended up living in Highlands Ranch well, on the Phipps Ranch. Yeah, well, my my mother and dad moved there in thir 1934. 34, and that yeah. was still then owned by Frank Kistler. Yes, at this yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, tell me about your memories growing up and some of your first experiences with horses. Well, I don't remember this, but my father tells the story that when we moved to the South Ranch, moved to where the hunt club is or was, 
uh, he we had, he had a pony and he put me on the pony and the pony did something and I fell off and hung my foot up in the stirrup and he said he drugged me a little ways down the fence and banged me around pretty good and he said no more of that so I went from a pony to a great big horse mm -hmm. <laughs> sometime from that that when I was three till whenever I I. I can remember the horse. He was a great big horse in my mind. Well, he was a big horse anyway. How many hands? Oh, he was probably 16 hands 16. high. So That's I went a from a pony horse. that was about yeah. two feet high. Yeah. To, well, to, the first of many times yeah. that you've been thrown. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that horse's name was Old Man Rivers. I can still remember that. Mm -hmm. I can remember falling, uh, yeah. falling off of him. Mm -hmm. He stumbled one day when I was pretty little and I fell off and rolled underneath my mother's horse. Scared my mother to death, didn't bother me. So, yep, yeah, gotcha. So at some point you were, you were you were growing up on the ranch there, and yeah. when you were maybe six, seven, whatever, you ended up going to elementary school. I went to school. Where did you go? Gan School, it was called. And where is that? And is it still around? No, it's uh, it's right across eighty five, east of eighty five, right at. Where you turned to go into Levere's mm -hmm. at the, that little settlement right there, <clears throat> and it was a one-room schoolhouse originally, a little white one-room schoolhouse, and then sometime before I started, they had built a, a, a an addition to it, a brick addition to it. It faced faced east and west. And they built the addition on the west end of the school, and it had a, it had a little horse barn <clears throat> on it. And uh, they, of course, it was an outside toilet. The boys' toilet was up on the hill part, right behind the schoolhouse, and the girls was on the on a little bit halfway down the hill, a little bit more south. We had a merry ground, a swing set, and a teeter totter. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think at that time we had a coal stove. And the history is, is interesting about the brick part and the white part, the wooden part, the, the Veers, which was right across just west there. The Veers started in 1917. Yeah. Whatever, owned by Company <clears throat> Town, company, uh, town uh, for DuPont. Yeah, I. The Veers, as I understand it, was named after a town in France. Yes. And they had, of course, the dynamite. And I was sitting in my desk the time, the first time that the magazine blew up. And that's, the, I can still remember, I looked up and the brick had separated from the wooden part of the schoolhouse about that far. Interesting. So consequently, yeah. the brick got torn down. Mm -hmm. And then we just had the one room wooden schoolhouse. So you said there were stables there. Yeah, they, there was a barn there where you could, apparently the youngsters had started long before I did. Uh, you could keep a horse there. Uh, originally, when I was six, my mother and dad would exercise the hounds and take me to school with my horse. And we, the fact of the matter is I can remember jumping a jump on the way, not a very mm -hmm. high jump, but I did do it. And my mother rode then too, of course. And they'd lead my horse back and then come get me in the car in the afternoon. And then when my sister, who was three years younger than me, started to school, we rode a horse double. How far was where you were living to the Gann School? Oh, probably a, a close to almost two miles, because it was a mile and a half from Santa Fe, the house was, and it was in a triangle. So it was, and then it was down south a bit. Yeah. On mm -hmm. what? became Santa Fe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when, when my sister and I rode in a horse, we just tied her in the barn all day and then we rode her home, rode double. Not too many people uh, these days do that. This <laughs> that lasted until one day we, there. The, I never had a full classmate, a, a classmate of full year, my eight grades in school. I had, why, why was that? Well, it just, there weren't very many people. The whole school got down to three twice and up to 13 twice. But <laughs> I, I never had a class, as I said, a classmate a full year. Was this year. K to eight in terms of the school? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, when I went to go to college as a side box, I thought, I, I, I don't know how I'm ever going to get in college. I, I don't know what kind of education I have. Well, it turns out it was like going to a tutor because the teacher had only a maximum of 13 to teach and sometimes three of us. So, so you ended up at uh, Douglas <laughs> County High School, Yeah, did you not? And That's right. How did you get there? I'm sure you didn't ride your horse. No, I didn't. It was a mile and a half to 85, as I mentioned. And my mom or dad had taken me down and the school bus had picked me up and I rode from there to Castle Rock, 13 miles to high school on the school bus. And I walked that mile and a half several times. I will never forget as a freshman in high school, one of the things they made the freshmen do, they made the boys wear a dress. Ooh. Oh, Ooh. I will never forget. I was Easy. so so embarrassed. And I can still remember walking to the school bus, <laughs> getting on that bus with a dress on. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. And I can remember walking home that night with the dress on. But I did that quite a, <clears throat> quite often. How large was your graduating class at Highlands or at Douglas County Third School? 30 of us. 30 of you. Yeah. And how did you fare in that? Well, I was a valedictorian. Well, that's not so bad Yeah. at this point. No. Uh, did you participate in any sporting activities when you were in high school? I played football, believe it or not, with my size, but there was only, I don't know how many this boys there were. Was eight men football? No, 11. 11. <clears throat> and how did uh, how Douglas County do? Well, tell you the story. <clears throat> Excuse me, tell you the story about it. I, my cousin was two years older than me, and he played football. And I, my cousin was I'm kind of my idol. He, His name was Jackie Roberts. And, I went to high school and he was playing football and my dad said, you are not going to play football. That's the dumbest game I've ever seen. He said, people line up and somebody says something and they cause the biggest fight you ever saw. And I'll never, I went home the second day and I said, dad, I really want to play football. Oh, he said, well, why is that? I said, well, there's three of us that's not playing. One guy is in the marching band and doesn't want to. The other guy has a broken leg and me. And he looked at me and he said, okay, if you want to play that damn fool game, here's the deal. If you agree, anytime I ask you to grab a horse by his hind legs, you're going to do it and hang on. That's I said, kind of a dangerous you, thing too. Isn't yeah, it? I said, yeah. You, you've got, you, it's a deal. So I started playing football and had a wonderful coach Oliver Matney was his name. And I, I, I think I'd fallen off of so many horses and truly fell off that I didn't, I wasn't afraid to get hurt and wasn't afraid to get down. And I started playing then in football. You asked me what I did. Mm -hmm. I started, well, there were 38 games that I participated in in high school. I didn't start one of those because I did something to my left shoulder and I wouldn't work for a while. I got to play in it eventually because it went away, but I played 38 games. What positions did you play? Left guard. Mm -hmm. Offense? Defense? Both. Both ways. Both ways. And I had the, my, the right guard was a little bit bigger than me and he was quick and I think the only reason I ever got to play was because I wasn't afraid to fall down, I wasn't afraid to get hurt. And I, I never forget lining up with Littleton. Littleton was in a different group than uh, we were. And their guards weighed 200 pounds. And I'm thinking, ooh, boy, what am I going to do? Well, pretty quick I figured out if, when the ball was hiked, if I went like that, he'd go over there and I'd go by him. I sacked the quarterback, I think, six or seven times, and I was a, the most valuable player. That's good. <laughs> and then I – and so – I'll never forget the, the line coach from Colorado A and M at that time came to talk to the the uh, high school, mm -hmm. Douglas County High School, and I said, "Do I? Do you think I could play football at Colorado A and M?" And he, I know he looked at me and thought, "Well, you, I weighed a astounding 125 pounds." Yeah. And <laughs> he said, "Well, yeah, if you want to try." 
<laughs> Big mistake. Did you but try? I did, and I made the freshman team. In fact, mm -hmm. I numeraled. And I think the only reason I did was because of the reason I've already articulated. And um, th there was an all, all conference halfback. The freshman scrimmaged against the varsity. And he came around, the, I can still remember, around his left end, and, and I was then playing a linebacker. <laughs> and I I don't think he, 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 I think he thought I was maybe the water boy. <laughs> I, he was, I knocked him cold. I started every game, <laughs> but boy, did I take a beating, and, and I decided I didn't want to do that. And then that's when... Colorado A&M started a polo team, and I'd been playing polo at home, and then I went from football to polo at Colorado A&M. So, what time of the year was polo uh, played? In fall and spring. Both. And this point. It went back to another part of my life, if it hadn't been for Mr. Phipps and those good polo ponies that he had, and he had taught me. He started teaching me to play polo when I was 12. What was your first experience? How old were you at the time? And where did you play polo prior to going to Cairo A&M? Mr. Phipps took his son, L.C. Phipps the third, and me. We were both the same age. And he started teaching us to play polo when we were 12. And this was Laurie you're speaking about? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And he taught us. He taught us to play. I'll never forget one of the first things he said now, gentlemen, and he said that to us two boys, polo is a game, hunting is a sport, don't confuse the two. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that I just, when they started the polo and I'd taken enough of beating that year <laughs> in, in the <laughs> College, I didn't do it anymore. By the way, I started, I graduated from Douglas County in the latter part of May, and I was, in, I enrolled at Colorado A&M, I was in June the 2nd. Because of the Korean War, I wanted to get two quarters of college so I could apply for OCS, because I was going to go to the Korean War. I, this was in the early 50s? Yeah, well, 51, 51. I graduated. Yeah. And so, anyhow, I had been through that, and then when I they started the polo, Mr. Phipps, and then I had played then from the time I was 12 at home and helped build the field. I was going to say, where did you play initially, and then uh, uh, tell me about building uh, the field. Well, you know where the, the horses that Highland Ranch has now, their, their horse program? Yes. That's the polo field. Mr. Phipps, right. Mr. Phipps had two track tractors, one international, one regular Caterpillar. That's on the way into the uh, <clears throat> what's now the Law Enforcement right. Training Center. Right, and he had a land leveler, and he and my dad talked about it, and we had we took the bulldozer. I didn't run the bulldozer then. I ran the Caterpillar to lever it part of the time, and we pushed it. That, there was a knoll. Well, if you look, it starts and drops off about where that archery deal starts. Mm -hmm. We pushed that dirt down and made that pole field. And it was a dirt field. And we started playing there. When, when the, Eventually, did that become an irrigated field? Yes. Mr. Fitzgerald, if there's a well, if you look right on the in the middle, no, east and west part, mm -hmm. over next to the sand gulfs, and he drilled the well there. And my dad irrigated it. We played on the dirt field for a while and then planted it with grass. And dad irrigated that and mowed it and took care of it. And, and which teams played there? Well, we had we had teams came from Kansas and played there. We had teams came from Texas and played there. You were on which team when well, you did I, play? I played on the Highlands Ranch team, mm -hmm. the Hunt Club team. Oh, it was the hunt club. Too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how did you do? Well, <laughs> given that you'd been on and off a horse since age three. Yeah. Well, I I started out, of course, in United States Polo Association. You the ratings go from now they are there's a zero and then there's a minus one, minus two, and I don't know, but there was none of that. You you went from zero to ten. 
And there's like, <clears throat> at that time, there was only like, I don't know, less than 10, 10 gold players in the United States. I mean, they were really good players. And so I obviously started out at zero and but went ahead and played then after I got out of veterinary school and during during veterinary school, played in the summertime. Well, I went from zero and I eventually got to be a three goal player. So uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, he, Lord C. Phipps, G, the third. He, he wanted you to yeah. uh, learn to whiff the yeah, same time. I, when and you we were played 12. polo together a lot. <clears throat> he, he stayed at a zero. Bill Sinclair, who lived on 105, uh, he, he, he and I were both three after I got out of high college at that time. He was a three goer and I was a three goer. And I didn't practice and some of the people, you know, this is kind of immaterial, but the people that came and played with us said, if you'd work at this game instead of doctoring horses and driving up and getting on your ponies and playing, thanks to Mr. Phipps's horses, my dad and my family and everybody exercising the horses, said, you'd be a five or six goaler. And I said, well, anyway, but anyway, that's. Oh, well. Uh, and in college, we, we qualified to play in the National Intercollegiate Finals. And we went to New York City and played in the Arm Squadron A Armory in New York City, indoor polo, that was. I would guess that most of the polo was played on the, the coast, the east coast and west coast. Yeah, it was, yeah. Well, but Mr. Phipps had been the wheel horse for polo here in Denver. And there were fields right there at Alameda and University that he, I, I think he owned what it were. And that Denver and then Colorado Springs had good fields and we played, I never did play. I had an exhibition game where there's an apartment now right there about two blocks east of, of University on Alameda. And we played a demonstration game there when they built that apartment house that's there. And uh, but we played at Highlands Ranch and then Bill Sinclair had a team and then we played in Colorado Springs. Bill and, <clears throat> Bill and I were invited to play. There was a team from Texas, or a fellow from Texas, that a, a big ranch in Texas came to Colorado Springs and he had a professional polo player. Billy Mayer was his name. And they invited Bill and I to play. And since we were both zero goal, well, we were both one at that time. So it, when you play, there's a rating. And you add up what the rates, the, mm -hmm. what, what, what your uh, handicap is. And then the other team, of course, the people playing Colorado Springs, they had a 10 goaler on one of those teams one of the top 10 goers in the United States. Well, Bill and I got to play because we had a one goal. We had good ponies. The pro had a five goal rating and the guy that paying all the money for the professional was zero. So we, we beat, <laughs> beat some of the top teams in Colorado Springs. This must be exp uh, expensive for a team from Texas to come up. Oh, it's really somebody expensive. Brought, yeah. Somebody had to bring their horses up. Yep. Yeah, yeah horses for two people. Oh, really expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the Colorado Springs had two really good fields. One was called the Broadmoor Field. Not surprising. And one was called the Country Club Field. The Country Club. All on the south side of Colorado Springs there. Well, right there, just down the street from the Broadmoor yeah. was the con where the Country Club is. There was a really good field there. Then the Broadmoor Field was just a block further north, and it had a grandstand. And so it was, it wasn't backyard polo, it was. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Let's go back in time a little bit. So you're in school at the Gand School, you rode your horse to, to class and back at this point. I'm assuming you were also uh, helping your dad, George, yeah. exercise the hounds yeah. at this point. Yeah. Tell me about those experiences mm -hmm. uh, in your elementary school years. Okay, well, as I mentioned, uh, when they w we were exercising hounds, they took me to school, the first, first right. grade, second grade, third grade. And so then I was used to exercising the hounds with my dad. And then the war came along, 1942. So I would have been nine years old then. 
and his whipper ends, who was his his youngest brother and my mother's youngest brother. One went to the army and one went to the navy. So I graduated to being the help for my dad to exercise the hounds pretty regular. And I, I did. Whippers were used even during exercise, not just hunts. What was that? Was a whipper in, uh, used during exercise yeah. periods? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. bet. In, in, any time they called the hunt staff, dad was a huntsman and the whipper ends. And so I got started. But my initial job when they all went to the Army for the first part of 1942 was to go right along in the field. By then, everybody was in the Army. There was only three or four people. I'd ride along and shut the gates and, and <laughs> fix yeah. jumps. I'd fall off on the jumps and get on and go, take another go at it. Yeah, and so that, and then I became then two young women, one Mr. Reginald Sinclair's daughter became a whipper in and a young woman from Colorado Springs became a whipper in while I was the gate boy. And uh, so then one of the, those young women married a, an Air Force pilot, Army Air Force pilot. And so when she left, then that's when I became the youngest recognized whipper in in the Masters of Fox Island of America. There's a picture in the Highlands Ranch Mansion in the Dawson area, which was taken sometime in the 40s. And sure enough, you're over there on the left side of the I picture. On the right side. On the right side of the picture. And that's the right, the right that, on the left side of the picture, but the right whipper in. The right whipper in. <clears throat> was there a, a difference? Of yes, sir. Duties? The right right hand whipper in was the first whipper in for the huntsman. Uh, and who's on the other side? Delta Darnia, one of those younger women that uh -huh. started as a teenager, then continued to hunt. Yeah, that's true. And Mr. Phipps in that picture too. Do you know that? I saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, some other uh, officers. Yeah, that was my uncle who was home on leave in that picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Where was that picture taken? It was remember? taken about. Uh, as the, where the target ranges are at the law enforcement mm -hmm. center, it was taken about halfway from the, the kennels on that road going towards the headquarters. That's where that picture's taken. Through the area that was uh, generally a, a homestead. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, where the kennels, from the kennels. Yeah. Right there, yeah. yeah, that's where that picture's taken. Yeah. Dad was on a mare called Duchess, and I was on a horse called a Rickery. Yeah, I've heard you speak of a rickery before. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned before you have a you have a top ten list of the horses That's that right. you've liked the yeah. most. I yeah. assume a rickery was on one of those. He is on one. He's he's he, for everything he did for me. He's a top ten. Is the rickery the one in the picture? No, no. Rickery wasn't as pretty as that horse, but that. Rick Reed did things for me when I was gate boy and when I was whipper in started out to just and he did he was an exceptional horse mentally and he wasn't a beautiful balanced horse but he was not a slouch and he did things that well I'd fall off at the damn jump or fall off trying to he'd stop because I didn't have legs long enough to make him go I'd fall off and he wouldn't run off. I'd lead him up to the jump, get on, and make another go at it, and usually made it the second time <laughs> when I was a gate boy. And then, so let's go back in time in your um, ages when you were basically nine to 12 to 15 or whatever. I'm assuming that you were exposed to different vets at that point that might have been yeah. doing work at. Uh, the Phipps Ranch at this point. One, one veterinarian. Who was that and how did they influence your uh -huh. career decision to become a vet? Well, his name was Dr. Oliver and he had an office in Denver. There used to be a standard bed racetrack at City Park and that's where the horses were kind of concentrated in Denver, I guess. I don't, I never remember, I don't remember the racetrack, but that's where he came from. And I guess probably Mr. Phipps got to know him when they were in Denver. So I, anyway, Mr. Phipps had an office in downtown Denver. Yeah. At one point. Yeah. 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 
and um, he he came and took care of the horses. And I, he drove a Cadillac car, always wore a white shirt and a necktie. And he just was a, well, I just idolized the guy. I got to watch him and he listened to all my questions. And I watched him work and, and do all of the things. And that he, he did the, he did a really neat thing. There was the, the horseshoers came from that part of Denver too. They were, I think it was three brothers. They were Irishmen, and they shod Dad's horses or Mr. Phipps's horses for my dad. Mm -hmm. And Doctor Oliver knew them pretty well, and he he had to make a little pair of horseshoes about that big. And he called me the kid, and he gave them to my mother, and he said, "When the kid graduates from veterinary school, give him those shoes." And I course have those shoes and your mother kept them yeah, yeah yeah so I guess getting back to everything I've done in my life has to do with a horse <laughs> everything yep. even to the getting a girlfriend that I eventually married <laughs> basically well, because of horses <laughs> well tell me about that <laughs> well I was I was playing polo as I said at CSU <clears throat> And she graduated the same year in high school as I did, but she didn't go to college the first year. But her cousin... And this lady uh, is known today as? Eunice Beeman. Eunice and what Beeman. was her maiden name? Matthews. Okay. Yeah. And so she wasn't at Carl A&M then, so how did you meet? Well, the first time I met her, she, her mother and one of my really good friends in college Plus, he turned was a fraternity brother and a veterinary student classmate too. His mother was a sister to my girl, eventually wife's mother, and they came to visit my her cousin. And I met her the first time there. We were building a float for college days at CSU. It was Colorado and M College, and I met her there, and and then she decided to go that was the first year when i was a freshman she came then when i was a sophomore she came as a freshman and since we'd met and her cousin was there and then she got to she go by and harass the fraternity <laughs> we'd catch them and, and squirt them with water and she's one of them i didn't know who the hell she was at that time <laughs> anyway that started it and then she found out we dated and, and some, and she said, well, I like to ride. And I thought, well, lots of girls have told me they like to ride, and they couldn't ride a stick horse. I thought, well, just we'll find out. And I put her on. This was up at Fort Collins. Yeah, because I had three ponies up there, yeah. and I went, and after school, I'd exercise them. And the ponies came from? Mr. Phipps. <clears throat> Mr. Phipps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... And they were boarded there somewhere yeah. well, on the campus. Well, I had a cousin up there that had a, a house with some acreage, and they let me keep my horses there, those three horses, for nothing, actually. And Mr. Phipp brought, had them, hay brought up the grain and all that stuff. Again, this one never happened without Mr. Highland Ranch and Mr. Phipps. It, sure. Yeah, it never would have happened. Because we didn't financially, there was no way in the world we could do that. But I rode the horses and broke the horses, and Dad did. And so anyway, Uni got on a horse and just rode off because she'd ridden bareback. Her mother wouldn't let her have a saddle when she was growing up because they worried about her getting her foot caught and getting in trouble. And I thought, well, that's not a bad deal. And so... <laughs> One thing led to another, and then I had a really ornery one that Dad and I had trouble getting along with, and she kept, and she was really a nice, good-looking mare, and she said, well, I want to write her name was Dutch Baby, and I thought, oh, boy, this is not going to work. <laughs> Finally, but she, she, but she tried. She tried and just rode that mare off, and that mare never moved a muscle, mm -hmm. and I let her ride her two or three times and we were playing Texas A&M and mom and dad were coming up to the game. And I, I said to dad, I, when I talked to him about coming up, I said, you're going to, I'm going to show you something. And it's going to really surprise you. Oh, he said, well, I, what is it? I said, well, I'll show you. Or on the horse. Well, on this bad horse. Yeah, on the bad horse. On the bad horse. Yeah. 
And I will never forget, she gets on her, her name, as I said, was Dutch Baby. And she just wrote it off and my dad looked at me and he said, well, I'll be damned. He said, you're crazier than hell. And he and I'd had trouble riding her. I said, dad, you just watch. And that mare never moved a muscle. So she, my girlfriend became my dad's really good girlfriend from, yep. from my standpoint. So when did you get married? We got married in 1955. And this was when you were where in school? Well, it was 52, 53. I mean, when, what year in school were you? Were well, you a when we got, undergraduate? When we got married? Yeah. No, it was between my sophomore and, and junior year of veterinary college. I, uh, so you're already in vet school. Yeah. My yeah. understanding, your diploma for undergraduate was from Colorado A&M. Because you correct. still had a choice of what was the, going to end up in your diploma. The name changed that year. And they yeah. said, so I took one. And your vet degree was from Colorado State University. Colorado State. Yeah. And my wife got a degree. The wives of the students, the, the, it was called the, the auxiliary situation of the regular junior veterinary organization. They gave our our wives a diploma, a PhD, and that's putting hubby through. <laughs> at this point. So at some point in the 50s, 1957, you graduated from vet school at Colorado State University. You would already have been married at this point. Yeah. And I guess you had to figure out what to do with your life. That's true. Well, a little bit of the background, and because of horses, because of Mr. Phipps, and because of my father, then the veterinarian, when the person that I mentioned, Dr. Oliver, when he, I guess, passed away, then Harry W. Johnson, who had been on the faculty at CSU, both before the war, and then he went into the army, and he went with a unit of soldiers to China with pack mules and packed the howitzers over, over the mountain into China. And then he came back and went back on the staff at Colorado State University. And then in 1950, when the racetrack opened, he decided he wanted to come to Littleton, and he came to Littleton. And which racetrack is this? That's Centennial. And where was that located? Well, it was located in Littleton, about three miles from here right across the river from just, uh, oh, just a little ways north of where the... On the west side of the river? West side of the river, mm -hmm. where the Essex Motel is. Do you know where yes, that is? I do. Right across there. The gate that went into the stable area of the racetrack was right there and crossed the river, and the grandstand was then on the west side. What type of racing did they do there? Thoroughbred racing, primarily. And later on, there was some quarter horse racing. I think they raced standard reds a little bit one time or two, but I'm not sure about that. I, I, but when I, when uh, Dr. Johnson, Harry W. Johnson, he first was in a building with a small animal veterinarian at Bellevue in Santa Fe, Dr. Howarth. And he started then working for my dad as a veterinarian, taking care of the horses. And that that stimulated even more my interest. I decided I was going to be be a veterinarian when I was seven years old. My dad and I, did I tell you this story? I think I did. I don't think you did. Yeah. Well, anyway, getting into the veterinary part, I, I, I don't want to get, get away from the family and the, what Mr. Pitt, we can do that because it's integrated for that. But uh, I, I was, really fascinated by Dr. Oliver, as I said. But then I'll, I can still remember the day we had been down south of Sedalia to visit the people. Two ranchers were down there, and their sister was a neighborhood ranch at the Hunt Clubs. And before we had elect electricity, which was in 1946, on the south ranch, <laughs> compared to the mansion, um, two miles away. I understood that the mansion got electricity earlier. Oh, it had it had electricity and everything, but well, we didn't. 
Yeah, I understood that was pretty common that a lot of places didn't yeah. get electricity until after World yeah. War II was over. Yeah, that's exactly. 1946, July the 3rd, 1946, the, the electrician climbed up the pole and hooked the electricity so because we'd given my dad an electric shave for his birthday on July the 3rd. <laughs> I can still remember that guy up the pole and remember what a deal it was. Yeah. Anyway, getting back to the, the history of the veterinary medicine, which again, the Highland Ranch, if it hadn't have been for Highland Ranch and the horses, I'd, I don't know what I'd have done, but when I was Dad and I had been down to this ranch, as I mentioned. On the way home, we were talking about, and some way or another, the conversation got, oh, what, what do you think you're going to do when you grow up? Oh, I'll be a rancher, farmer, want to hunt hounds, and I'll do that kind of stuff. And then I said, you know what I really think I'll do is be a veterinarian. And you were seven then. Seven. Yeah. And we were just had just turned off of Santa Fe, and I can remember making that decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, I wobbled away from it a time or two. The most significant thing was I had pretty significant asthma as I grew up, which was an asset in many respects because I couldn't clean the barn because I just about choked to death. <laughs> so I went outside and raked the corral and ran cold water on the crippled horse's legs. And get me out of doing that. But anyway, uh, uh, with it, when in high school with the asthma, I I thought if I'm allergic to horses, I'm go not going to go to veterinary school. I'm going to go to medical school. Well, they tested me, and I was allergic to all of the dust in the barn, but not the horses. And Interesting. That, so yeah. that I decided to go on and go to veterinary. I understand school. Mr. Phipps had a had a problem with asthma too. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah, I did not know that. The story that I'd always been told was that uh, he wasn't around much in the summer months because of these conditions. Yeah. And instead, he would go to Catalina Island off right. the coast of Los Angeles. Right. And had, had a boat. Most of the time there. Yeah, he had because a boat. I, I don't know how or much time. I didn't know that it was because of his allergy. Yeah. Well, not a bad place to hang no, out, too. No. We got to go, first vac one of the first vacations my mom and dad took, we went to San Diego, and Mr. Phipps invited us to go out on the boat. Yeah. I caught three barracuda fish. <laughs> I thought he had, a, he had a houseboat, didn't he? Well, I don't know what it was or called. Off the coast of the, California, some, off of Kettling Island. I don't know if it's a house. Well, it was a pretty fancy boat. I know that. Well, probably. Yeah. yeah. At that point. Yeah, well, anyhow. that's good. So I guess this turned out pretty good from age seven, and you're a little older than that today, of not being a bad uh, career de decision that you'd made and then stuck with it yeah. for yeah. all these years. And the the... Veterinary wise, we'll talk about that. In retrospect, that experience with those horses has, has given, gave me a real leg up on equine veterinary medicine because here were about 100 head of horses in the wintertime. That counted the babies that were just being weaned the yearlings, the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds, plus there was 47 hunters clipped, hunting regularly, lived in that barn. And this is the one that what's now the law enforcement training? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The big barn that had burned down. Yeah. And the hounds are there too. The hounds were there, yeah. So that that set the stage for me to be an equine practitioner. And uh, the horse, a significant point is when I went into veterinary school, there were seven of us in the same class that were in the same fraternity. So there was a pretty close knit group of us. And they were all going to either be regular general practitioners or a couple of them were going to do cattle work. and. The rest of them going to do small animals. Well, they all wound up eventually doing small animals, except me, and <laughs> I was not not going to be that. Anyway, anyhow, 
because of that relationship, then that's why I became an equine practitioner. And I was the only one in the class of 60 that said that's what he was going to do. On a 50-year class reunion, one of my classmates stood up and said, there's one guy in this room that's still doing what he said he was going to do the day he walked into veterinary school. And he pointed to me. And But here again, because of the horse situation, it has provided me with a wonderful professional exposure to lots of things. So when you started uh, in this practice, when you graduated from vet school, you had a partner? Well, Dr. Johnson owned it, and I went to work for him, and then he had he had me buy into the practice in just a year or two because it were, turned out we were we were doing a lot of work at the racetrack, and then we and we did about thirty percent cattle work. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said earlier, Highlands Ranch I think had somewhere between eight and nine hundred mother cows. So, what type of work did you do at the ranch involving the cattle? Well, and what type of cattle were they? Well, they were Hereford cattle, beef cattle, and he had a purebred breed, or not breed, a purebred strain. Mm -hmm. uh, the pasture that goes straight they were kept down the Douglas pasture, weren't they? Well, I don't know what those pasture names. Uh, the one south uh, on the failing homestead. No, no, that's that. No, no, no. That was something different. Yeah, he bought that. He bought that failing homestead. I think he bought that in. That was in the forties, because it didn't belong to him when I can still remember. Mm -hmm. And he bought that. Now the purebred pasture was a pasture that went straight east from the barns, the cow barns, straight east to to the uh, Daniel Park Road. Okay. That was a purebred pasture. Yeah. That's where the purebred cattle stayed. And then the other cattle were, they, they didn't use the the acreage that was where the kennels were. They didn't use the cattle then. They did earlier on, when Kistler had it. When when Dad first moved there, there were cattle there. But then the, the front pasture was the biggest pasture. And that was from county line to the, to the ranch house and the building and went from the Daniels Park Road to Santa Fe. That's right. probably eight, ten miles. Yeah, it was, I, yeah. Give or take. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the, part of that, then he bought the cheese ranch sometime during the war. And then he bought, and, and that like, was called the East Pasture? No. That was called the Cheese Ranch. Just called the Cheese Ranch. It, it was separated from the main ranch by the Daniels Park Road. It was all, it was all yeah. east of that. But we hunted all that country. So all, anyway, all the way up to Wildcat. Yeah, including Wildcat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, what type of work did you do with the cattle? I'm well, assuming uh, spring activities. After well, the mostly was the. I vaccinated the calves for brucellosis because the veterinarian had to do that. Mm -hmm. He had some pigs, and I vaccinated the pigs for hog collar. <laughs> I didn't do any much else with the That's pigs. That's pretty far away from working with horses. That's true. <laughs> but the cattle, I enjoyed the cattle work. It was 30% of the practice when I started with cattle, and we had several ranches on 105. Mr. Phipps's daughter, mm -hmm. both of his daughters had cattle on 105 and we did that cattle work and the so most you were all over the county then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. with your pickup truck with my pickup truck yeah. i was wearing a pickup truck out every two years because yeah. we didn't have a hospital good all the while you're uh, you're having a family too at some point right right when yeah. did that start happening well our first child was born in, in 59 grant was born in 59 so and you've been married a couple of years but that point or? yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, and that well, was four years. Actually. That was your daughter, Lori. No, that was Grant yeah. Marvin Beeman. There's three GM Beemans in the four, <laughs> three of us: it, Dad, me, and him. And then Lorianne was born in '60. A year she was born in December, so she just was a month short of being two years younger than her brother. Yeah. And she was born when we were living in Highland Ranch, in the cottage. 
but to get back to the practice part of it, and um, I had a job offer in Bowdoin, Montana, and a job offer in Kentucky, and this job here because I actually my dad helped Dr. Johnson originally, and then I helped for him, and then I, I worked for him in the summer before I graduated, and then he hired me out of school, and I came back because of my relationship with the hunt. Sure. Now, That's, what were the offers? The offers were in Montana. Montana and was a general practice in Montana, and but Kentucky, not especially with horses. No, Kentucky, of course, would have been a horse related, horse, and it was probably the most tempting. But I didn't want to leave here because of Highland Ranch. Beemans have been here since the 1850s. Yeah, <laughs> it would be hard to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, that's how I came back there and, and got started with Dr. Johnson. And okay. Well, speaking I, of Dr. Johnson and the Centennial Racetrack, whatever yeah. big event occurred in 1965 yeah. when mm -hmm. there was a, a gigantic flood that started mm -hmm. south and southwest of right. here. Centennial Racetrack's right by the Platte River Right at this point. What was your involvement during that? Uh, that was the most monumental uh, yeah. activity at that significant point. disaster horse-wise in my life. It was just we knew the flood was coming, and the you water was a little bit advance notice. Yeah, on that. and unfortunately, law enforcement didn't let those guys take their horses and go someplace. How uh, many the, horses were there at the about time? About eighteen hundred, I think. 1,800 horses? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, you all race horses. All race horses. Yeah. To that point, one stable of two stables took their horses and went to the grandstand on the west side of the racetrack. And the water got up to within about four feet of them, but never did wash them away. The other horses just went down the river. And there was 29 of them trapped at Bellevue because their stalls washed away and his horses were still alive, trapped against Bellevue, scrunched up in these stalls. When we got to them the next couple of days, of course, they all, they all died eventually. One of the worst things for me was one mare had gotten out and she, we picked her, I went helped get her in a junk pile, automobile junk deal down there, probably, oh, down the river a mile, mile and a half, or down Bellevue a mile, mile and a half, not down the river. And she had lacerations and that dirty water was, and we moved her to a, a client's place out on Quincy. And bless her heart, she was still alive. And, and uh, I drained eight gallons of that crap off of her. Wow. Of course, she died a couple of days later, but I tried to save her. And I never felt so sorry for horses in my life as that did. And if, if the law enforcement just left those guys alone, uh, but they thought, and rightfully so, they were going to drown. And said, you just have to make a decision that you're, you're going to go out of here. And, uh, what happened to the racetrack after that? Was they rebuilt, it rebuilt at all? They rebuilt it. Yeah, rebuilt it and went back to running. So when, when I first started practice in the summertime, we'd go to the racetrack early in the morning, and then we'd go do our country work from the rest of the day, and that's why you work. All over the county. Yeah, all over the county. Yeah, mm -hmm. all over the county. And the cattle work at the ranch, the biggest thing there was I did cesarean sections. My wife became my surgical assistant for the cesarean mm -hmm. sections, and, and she helped me other places too. We had the unique situation. I don't. I've never talked to anybody. I'm sure it's happened, but a really good rancher, Easter Parker, called and said, "Oh, doctor, he said I, this cow's five years old," which was the first clue that it was a major problem, having trouble having a calf, and mm -hmm. uh, I need you to come. And well, Uni, I knew I, if he couldn't get the calf there, then I knew that it was a probably a cesarean or something like that. Yeah. And uh, so I called Uni was at the dentist, and I called her and I said, "We'd have to go to to th this ranch and do, 
dystocia, this cow. And, and so she said, well, I don't have any shoes that are fit. She had her dress shoes on at the dentist and we had to stop by J.C. Penney's and buy her pair of shoes on the way. And we get there and it, by then it was just kind of late afternoon. And uh, we got there and this guy, this really gentleman rancher said, well, this cow's here and here. And so I get ready to go in the barn and Uni was going with me and he shut the door in her face. And I thought, well, he upset and just didn't think much about it. And I examined this cow and I, as far as I could reach, I realized it had two heads. So I said, well, guess what? Guess what? We, the only way we can save this cow is to do a cesarean. Well, he said, let's do one. So went back to get my instruments and my assistant. And so I got my instruments and the things I needed and my wife, my assistant, and we started in the barn and he shut the door in her face again. And I said, well, my wife has to come with me. He kind of looked down and was kind of embarrassed. He said, Dr. Beeman, there has never been a woman in my barn. I said, okay, you're either going to become a surgical assistant or there's going to be the first woman in your barn. Well, he said, I guess it's going to be the first woman in the barn. But anyway, we went through the process of getting this cow ready for surgery and, and uh, we made a incision where we normally do about that long in the left flank. And Have you done a lot of cesareans up to that point? Yeah, I've done because of Island Ranch, and I, the first one I did was right across the river here. I did it on an Angus cow by myself. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I'd gotten to where, well, like I said, the night of my birthday, we did two. And you know, we were having a birthday party. Of course, it didn't happen until we got done in the barn doing the surgery. We opened this cow up, and I thought, man, this calf is huge. And you make the incisions, the proper incisions, and I got two legs and I pulled and nothing happened. And I made a bigger incision and I pulled and nothing happened. Anyway, it turned out to be a set of Siamese twins. Wow. They were stuck together, together. just like two, just yeah. chest to chest. They had one chest, one neck, two heads, two mouths, three eyes. They had eye here and here and one in the middle. You ever experienced that before? Oh, no. Or afterwards? No, or not. Damn few people have. Yeah. Anyway, we had a hell of a time getting that those calves out of the cow. And I had to get Mr. Ruggles with his name. I had to get him to help me pull. And I had the chains, sterile stuff, ready. And he pulled and he pulled these, cows, these calves out. But they died just before we got them out of the cow. I did the calf live? Or did the cow live? The cow live. Yeah, but well, during the process, saving grace there. sewing all this stuff up, this, this really good rancher tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Doctor, Doctor, he said, I just have to move those calves. This poor cow wakes up and sees that terrible mess, she's just going to die. That's <laughs> all yeah. so you do that. Well, anyway, by that time it's late and his wife had dinner ready for us. And when we walked in, she said to my wife, Well, I understand you're the first woman that's ever been in this barn when that cow lived. Go figure. And I sent the calves up to CSU, and they I'm not sure they didn't mount them and have them up there. Mm -hmm. So unusual. Yeah. yeah. So. Experience that you've told me about before, uh, we did an oral history with you back in 2013. When I asked you at the time what was one of the most memorable vet experiences you'd had at the Highlands Ranch, and you talked about a situation where <clears throat> you had the potential to uh, deliver a couple twin horses. Right. Tell, tell us more about this. Well, this, the, the history of this, we were living at the ranch in the cottage at that time. And this mare was in full. We knew she was in full. And uh, in fact, my dad had ridden her and my wife had ridden her. And uh, he called me, well, I don't what, know what time it was, but he said, you have to come. He said, this mare just had a big normal baby, but he said, I, I'm sure she's going to have another one. So the kids and Lori. This is pretty unusual. But, yeah, one in 10,000. Yeah. Yeah. One in 10,000 has a life set of twins. 
statistically. And uh, so we jumped in the truck and went over the hill from the headquarters over to the kennels. And just as I got there, the little twin was born and she was about half the size as her brother. And Lori Ann was six years old. And it's your daughter. That's our daughter, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we, everything was fine. She, the little thing finally stood up and, and she couldn't nurse. She was too weak to nurse. And so my dad, Lori Ann's grandfather, Lori Ann stayed there with my grand, my mother and dad. They fed that little thing every three hours for three days wow. with a bottle. And the little devil went to the pasture with her brother on the fourth day. And then my daughter rode that filly when she was a year and a half old unbeknownst to us <laughs> and then she hunted her and then she is the mother of that horse i showed you in the hallway with the hounds that mm -hmm. that twin and the survival rate is one in ten thousand sets of twins yeah. Yeah. good story yeah well, it's, it's another thing in my life that had to do with horses so uniquely had i not been a veterinarian i wouldn't have been called to be involved from the time it was and then see that my daughter ride that mare and and that gets us back to the family part of what the contribution of lc phipps jr now rapo hunt club and highlands ranch did for them because mm -hmm. they grew up they could ride really good horses. <laughs> they never rode ponies. They just got to ride those really good horses. And my wife just kept going. In fact, the matter is, she became a whipper in for my dad, and which was one of the most significant honors, meaningful to me, because my dad came to me and he said, I need an in whip. That's one that stays in with mm -hmm. this huntsman and the hound. I'm going to ask you need to be be that. I said, well, what, this tickles me to death. So you make we, a lot of history. First, yeah. it was you at yeah. 13, whatever, yeah. being yeah. a whipper in. Yeah. And now your wife yeah. is a wife. female whipper. And then my kids, my dad was so good and my mother, my mother, that they they didn't say, oh, I have to go ride. I can't go skiing. They wanted to go ride. And so my wife and my kids would exercise my polo ponies and my dad. And I'd practice, I was practicing and I'd be behind. I'd run out there, get out of my truck and get on my ponies and play. And they'd walk them when they were hot. And then when they were little, I would take them on my saddle and ride from the polo field that's there now up to the kennels. Both of them, both of them became whipper ends for my dad. And both of them became whipper ends as my wife did for me. So we've had my dad, me, and my sister, she was a whipper end. And then my wife and my kids, all because of Highland Ranch, Mr. Phipps, and the horses. Yeah. And it developed a, 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 they went skiing maybe 10 times. Hell, they stayed home and went hunt, hunting. And on, we hunted on Saturday for the kids. So let's transition into your specialty dealing more with horses than cattle. There's a, uh, a phrase, what was it called? Uh, confirmation? Or? Well, there's a there, the confirmation relationship of form to function is, a, is a, how a horse is built. And you're known for that, aren't you? Yes, yeah. Tell me how that all developed. Well, it all started because when I was my in my younger ages, I I would go with my dad and we'd look at horses and do look at the horses we had all the time. And I there was a guy by the name of Paul Brown that had talked about structures and taking pictures of horses, and I got to thinking I knew what was a horse looked like and. Uh, I'd look at a horse and say, boy, did a good horse for a horse that might but have some problems. Anybody's horse or it, that I was exposed to. And I'm, boy, that's a pretty horse. My dad would say, that horse isn't worth a damn. Look at this, look at that. And that stimulated me to get interested in the confirmation of the horses. And then 
uh, one of the hunt members who's in that picture, by the way, was a doctor and he had a, put together some slides and talked about the confirmation. And that fascinated me. And then Paul Brown, as I said, did. And, and so I had kind of gotten really interested in it. And then along came the president of the American Court Horse Association, who was a president, a client of ours. And he said to me, Dr. Beeman, can you get a bunch of slides together and show these judges what the hell a good horse is supposed to look like, <laughs> especially their legs? The judges knew about a lot of the, just the general picture of a quarter horse. So I started with a, some slides and started putting it together and then became the chief instructor for the judges seminars of the American Quarter Horse Association, which, by the way, is the biggest registry of the horses in the world. Where do these occur, typically? Oh, all over the country. All over? All over the country. And I just kept adding to the slides and adding to the slides. And then I did it for the Morris Animal Foundation. I did it for the Palomino Association, the, the Morgan Horses, thoroughbred people. And it, it's just grown and grown and grown. So you mentioned earlier that you visited 47 of the 50 in the United States. Right, right. And that's all... Be that was because part of it was because of lecturing and i i never one time went to an organization and said i've got something i'd like to tell you but i got invited to go to the american association they would ask you yeah they'd ask me and i i in addition to the confirmation deal i talked about suits and wounds and talked about lameness and talked and, and that's that that part of it took me to Germany and to England and Ireland and Scotland and Republic of South Africa. To quite, go, quite a few foreign countries. And go look at horses and being aware of what I knew medically and confirmation wise, I, I went to a lot of countries to look at horses for people to buy. Yeah. You were involved in a famous rescue to some degree in the 90, 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. Yes, sir. Tell me again the story. Okay. It's a good story. It's yeah. worth repeating. Well, it, it, I got to go back to the beginning of it. The beginning of it was uh, I was away doing something and there was a farm here that was putting on a horse show. And we'd been invited to come to the after show party. And uh, I was, I, I don't know, I was somewhere. And he said, well, I'm going to pick you up at the airport. And we're going to go by this party. I said, I'm not going to go by that party and have somebody from the East tell us how, how stupid we are here in Colorado. <laughs> Which happened quite a bit. West of the Mississippi River, you didn't, just like this practice. Was, yeah, there's an East Coast bias on a lot right. of things. I'm not going to go listen to this woman tell me about what I don't know. I know I don't know a lot, but I don't need to be told it. I was tired. I'd been traveling and lecturing. And so he gets to this farm, and, and um, so pretty soon they says, well, we want you to meet the judge. And I thought, well, here we go. <laughs> and here come this, came this lady, young woman, and uh, uh, she was just a, just looked like a really nice person. And she started visiting with me and I thought, well, this is pretty good. She hasn't told me what we don't know yet. <laughs> and she just got nicer and nicer and nicer. Pretty soon she said, we're, I'm, I'm riding some horses in Connecticut and this, the owner wants to do some breeding. Do you know anything about breeding horses. I said, well, I've had a lot of experience, but I said, I'll tell you who knows about it. Colorado State University at that time was the leading place in the world on equine reproduction because of a guy named Dr. Pickett. And I said, that's where you need to go, way beyond what my ability is. Well, she said, do you know him? I said, yeah, I know him pretty well. Well, she said, can you introduce me to those people? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And so I did. And that was in, I don't remember exactly what time of year it was, but uh, later on, then that next 
spring, I had a horse wreck and broke all the ribs off the right side of my back. And I was laid up and they called me from CSU and said, this particular farm has come, wants to buy brood mares. And they want somebody to go along to look at them from a confirmational standpoint. Would you go? I said, well, I'm not doing anything. I'm trying to recover from this wreck. So I went with them. It was Melanie Smith, then became Taylor, and her she mother. She was the owner. She was the writer. The writer. The writer. <clears throat> Who was the owner? Mark St. James was his name. And he wasn't. He wasn't a horseman at all. He just was interested in them, paying the bills and having a horse to brag about that had these capabilities. So I went with them, and I didn't think much about it. So I, you went to Connecticut? No, they came out to Colorado. We went around and looked at horses here because they had a stallion up at, at the CSU that they were going to be interested in. And you were the confirmation expert. Yeah, well, it's supposedly expert. Yeah. In, Anyhow, that got us started, and I didn't think anything about it. So later on that summer, Melanie called me, and she, they'd had the horse up to, to Spruce Meadows in Canada, which is a big horse deal in Canada. And he got hurt, and they said, would you come and look at him? Which and, horse is this again? Calypso. Okay. Calypso is a thoroughbred? No, and, uh, he, he, he was a Dutch warm blood. And it was a jumper? Yeah. Yeah, Melanie had gone over there and, and bought Melanie him. Melanie was the rider. Yeah, she had yeah. she had bought him, and he'd been turned down by the hotshot riders. Well, she was a hotshot rider in the United States, but some of the other people had turned the horse down, and she bought him. And uh, so he got hurt, and I I said, well, I I'm honored that you'd ask me, but I said there's a hell of a lot of veterinarians between me and Connecticut. <laughs> Sure. Well, well, they said we we want we we've met you and know what you're doing. Would you come? And I said, well, yeah, I'll come. Look at him, and so that was the year Lori Ann was going to go to Columbia University. She graduated from CU, and then was it's pretty a, close a, a, accepted into the the uh, physical therapy program at Columbia. And so I said, well, we're coming to New York. In first part of September, well, I said, we'll pick you up and take you to the farm in Connecticut. So we were, Uni and I were always, were standing there waiting for to be picked up by the owner. And we didn't know what he looked like. We didn't have any idea. And we surmised that he, that was in this, oh, that would have been 80 something. And well, no, that was probably eighty-three, not eighty-four. Well, eighty probably. Yeah, eighty, eighty, eighty-one. And oh, he's going to show up with a with a long hair, and he's going to have a gold necklace, and his shirt's going to be unbuttoned down to his belly button. <laughs> <laughs> so this this uh, Rolls Royce pulls up, and. We were standing there on the curb, and so he was looking at us, and I said, well, Uni, maybe this is what, this is what we're going to get to ride to Connecticut in. And the owner gets out with a tweed coat on, a white shirt, and a necktie, and gray flannel pants. <laughs> and just, just dressed to a T, business-wise. So that was a big step there. So then we gets to the farm in Connecticut, Litchfield, Connecticut. <laughs> We, we drives up to the house, and the house is built in a U, like some of the French houses, and, and this one wing. He said, now that wing is for the visitors, and that's where you're going to stay. Good. And he goes up there, and here's this apartment, and they had a bed with a canopy over the top of it, beautiful, and a nice kitchen and everything. And so by that time, it was late afternoon, so we had dinner and went to bed and got up and started looking. And that's when I started looking at Calypso and his stable mates. And so I did that and that was that was eighty that was eighty one uh yeah, eighty eighty one, eighty two and what it, was what was the injury and what did you do to him? He had a broken splint inside hmm. the cannon bone 
this bone is the big one, and then there's a vestige of when they were horses were three toed, and he'd broken that. And uh, I I had quite a, not a lot of experience, but enough experience that I treated it very conservatively, and it did fine. So that turned out that I started going there then every 60 days, taking care of him and the other horses. Mm -hmm. And then they they bought an x-ray machine and and all that stuff. And, and, and I made a, an association with a local veterinarian, so if I needed that to help me. Mm -hmm. And that led to getting him qualified for the Olympics and gets qualified for the Olympics. And he was this, the owner didn't, didn't, was not as significantly contributor to the Olympic team as the other horses were, and so they he was a veterinarian from Colorado and not in the circles with the, the others, so suspect <laughs> from word go. Yeah, and uh, so, so we get to '84, and yeah. the Olympics are mm -hmm. in the summer in Los Angeles, yeah. And you're a member of the Roundup Riders right. of the Rockies, right? At about the same time, right? Yeah, well, their their ride was their ride was it the same it was in July, the and third week in, of July, and the and you're in the Mount Circle Wilderness area above Steamboat Springs, right? Yeah. On a ride for how many days? Well, a week, pretty far away from yeah. civilization, right? Right. So take it from there. Well. The the horse the horse he'd gotten over things and at that time then was the leading money winner in the world in stadium jumping. And we'd gotten him through that show and he did fine and then I worked on a lot of the other horses. And for some reason on Monday of that ride I called because the horses went from Connecticut to, to the Olympic Center in New Jersey. And then they were going to load them on the airplane there and go to California. And I called on Monday and everything was fine because we were, we crossed over where we could use a telephone on the road north of Steamboat Springs and everything was fine. And so then that was on Monday. So then on Thursday, the horse had gone to California between then and got off the airplane lame. And mm. and uh, pretty lame. And uh, Melanie then called the office and said, "Where's Doctor Beeman?" And they said, well, "He's in the mountains. On a, he's a veterinarian for the for the Roundup ride." And uh, well, they she told the office what had happened, and so they had a way to call the forest rangers on. And get in touch with us. So the the office called the forest ranger that knew where we were and said they need Dr. Beeman in Los Angeles because Calypso is crippled. And by the way, when we talked to Melanie, she was crying. <laughs> and, so, and by the way, there's an airplane waiting for you in Steamboat Springs. And there's a ticket for you to when you get to Denver from Steamboat to be in Los Angeles. If you can possibly come, come. And so here came the fourth ranger. We were just riding into camp, so we were on a road. And he, I see him stop. So he, and I had a feeling. I thought, like, what? And he kept coming. And I thought, well, I'm the end of the line because that's where the veterinarian rode. And he said, I'm looking for a guy named Beeman. I said, well, that's me. He said, well, here's the message. And he told me what I just told you. So I said, well, and I galloped my horse to camp, tied him up to the picket line, took what clothes I had there, went to Steamboat Springs and got in a private one single engine plane in July, the last week in July, <laughs> when it was rainy and cloudy and that airplane was going this way and that way. And I thought, well, my career's going to end here when this thing crashes. <laughs> Landed, got on an airplane, was in Los Angeles, was there for three weeks. And then they, every I I used what I'd learned on the roundup ride to get his foot better. And of course they suspected that I was using some magic kind of illegal medication and being an outsider. So you're being tested all the time, yeah, I take it. Yeah. Uni I came home one weekend because I didn't have any clothes. 
Well, I had what I had on, yeah. and that's all. Came home and got uni and clothes and, and went back. And, and so I'd take a blood test because he could use one of this drugs called butazol, a non steroid like aspirin. And I, I knew what the levels were accepted by the FEI of the world. And uni would take the blood, get it tested at a laboratory down, she'd drive down <laughs> towards San Diego and get it tested. And every time, every day, they'd say, what are you giving that horse? And I'd say, here's what I'm giving him. Here's, the, here's my records. Here's the doctor. Well, and I did, this just went on then, getting ready for the Olympics. And the big, big event that was so significant was by then he was a lot better. They had a friendly competition where every horse that had come to the Olympics from around the world, 97 horses could be in this competition. And Melanie came to me and she said, if we don't do well Saturday, they're going to put me on the backup list. What do you think? I said, I think we can make it. And I knew the farrier that was working there. I went to him. I said, can you keep a shoe on this horse with four nails, just two and three? On each side, he said, I think so. Well, out of the 97 horses, Calypso got second. And the other team member. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So then, and every day they would come and say, the shift to keep and say, we're going to look at these horses at 530. I'd be there at five. And they might come at seven. I'd be standing there. What are you giving them? Here's what I'm giving them. <laughs> and... Uh, that went on until, well, actually, the day after the friendly competition, they said, well, let me back up just a little. They'd say, well, we won't be here till 7 tomorrow. I'd be there at 5, and they might come at 6 because thinking I wasn't going to be there. Mm -hmm. Look at the horse. And we were stable right next to the German horses. <laughs> so anyway, we gets up to the last time. And they said, what are you giving that? I said, here, I've been telling you. Well, pretty soon I said to the chef to keep, I said, I know what happened to one of the horses got injected with not illegal medication, but he had a bad leg. I know what he got day before yesterday. And I said, I know what another one got yesterday. Now, I said, if we don't keep this on the up and up, I guess the best thing shot I have is I'll talk, tell the press about what kind of discussions we're having. What do you mean? I said, just what I said. Well, this one horse was lame, and so he, he went on the reserve list. Calypso went on there. And then I'll never forget warming out in the racetrack when they were warming him up. But this was at Santa Anita. And they, uh, Melanie knew that one of the best trainers in the country, and he was out there helping her. And I, I'm, I had his coat and tie on because I... That's the way I practiced, not every day, but I had a tie on every day. And I'll never forget this horse came down in the warm up area and the jump was four inches higher than me. It's not planned on? Yeah, one rail. All that horse had to do was lower his head down and run underneath that rail, and he jumped that rail, and this really good trainer said, He's ready. And uh, so we went down the racetrack and got ready to go in the stands in the arena. And I went up in the stands and I was sweating so badly <laughs> that the owner and his wife and Muni looked at me and said, what in the world is the matter with you? I said, I am so nervous. I don't know if I can even walk. I said, I'm not sure I can watch. I think I'm going to get underneath the seats. <laughs> and then he he had a clean round and then the jump off. And when he Three jumps in the Olympics, oh, uh, there were probably I don't know the exact number, I, I the set number yeah, like 20 or so, oh, 16, I think, something like that. Well, I'd done a pre purchase on a horse from Canada prior to that, and he was slated to win the Olympics, and the horse from Germany was. The two of them were kind of the picks. Well, this horse and this horse that I'd done the pre purchase had a pretty bad heart murmur, and we turned him down because of that. Well, coming down the final line of the jumps, the last three, he ran out of 
gas knocked the last three jumps down. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. And Calypso had gotten a little bit anemic with the medication. Oh, my God. He's going to run out of gas. Well, anyway, when he landed over the last fence, that meant we'd won the gold medal. And that was, um, we, I say, well, I. Pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you had a role. Yeah, I had a role. That's in, good. And that's, that's why she said what she said on that picture I showed you in the hallway. Well, let's move on to perhaps a final topic. <clears throat> Is your involvement with the uh, stock show in January mm -hmm. each year here? Well, uh, because of my association with the fellows at, at, at told you about the confirmation mm -hmm. with uh, Mr. Ed Hahnen, who owned the McCoy Cattle Caterpillar dealership here and had been a, a contractor, real good contractor during the war. Built, back to built Fort Carson and, uh, and gave the government back $5 million, by the way. Uh, he was real active in the Rocky Mountain Court Horse Association. And I started going to the stock show when I was six years old. Mr. Phipps had a box, and he'd give my mom and dad tickets once. And what did you do there as yeah. a six-year-old? Just watched. Observe? Just watched. Mm -hmm. And every year, until I got out of veterinary school, oh, I probably didn't go when I was in veterinary school. Anyway, they came to me, and they had a the Rocky Mountain Coral Association had a sale at Denver. It was a really... I mean, there'd be like 200 horses consigned, and they'd only sell 100. And because I'd worked for the Mr. Hahn, and they said, would you come and inspect the horses veterinary-wise with the other, because they had to get rid of a, they had 200 horses consigned, they'd only going to sell 100, so they had to get rid of some of them. It, and so it, you had a chance to really, so I was given, my first job was given in 1958, at the National Western, doing that. And then the county agent of Douglas County, who I had gone to school with his kids, he recognized what I was doing, and he was the manager of the livestock, which included the horses at the National Western. So then in about 19... Nine, about well, 1960, he said, would you be the ho veterinarian for the horse part? So I said, yes. And what does the veterinarian do? Being on call there for the horses. What type of things would come up oh, that you'd look at horses? Oh, any kind of cough or cripple or belly aches or whatever, to the point that we had to be there 24 hours. And so my wife and my two little kids would go. We stayed in the Holiday Inn just down across I-25 and be there. And you had to get up in the middle of the night if somebody had a horse or somebody that thought the horse had trouble. And so you had to be there all that time. And Uni would drive the kids to school from down there out here in Littleton. And so that started it. And then Dr. Vale came along, and he got involved, and Dr. Swanson came along, he got involved, and we're still the horse, the veterinarian for the horse department of the National Western, so since 1958 to now. That's a long period of yeah, time. Yeah, had some wonderful exposures and some wonderful experiences to that deal. You've been on the board of various committees? Yes, sir. I and was, have you gotten any awards from the stock show? Well, uh, I know you're a modest guy here. Uh, it's uh, the the uh, I, I then became a, a, a part of the horse department more. Actually, I went to work there in 1997, and with the and still worked here just on one day to replace. The, who was the chairman at the time, he was going to run for the governor, and he didn't, thank goodness, because I found out I didn't want to run a horse show instead of practicing veterinary medicine. But anyway, I went from being on committees to there to being in line to take over as a, as a CEO. 
I didn't do that, but I was on the board. I'm on the board emeritus now, and I'm chairman of one committee and on three other committees, and uh, have been still involved. In, still involved, yeah, yeah, still involved. And it's it is a marvelous situation. It started out in 1906. That that was the first opening. It was a nucleus for the livestock industry to expose their animals for purchase, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's still one of the largest livestock shows in the world. Mm -hmm. And now it's a it's a wonderful educational thing for the people that have little exposure to livestock industry. That's it. It's a big show. Big Lots show. People go. Yeah. Yeah. Stock show weather has yeah. <clears throat> changed a little bit over the years. It's not <laughs> well, quite as yeah. bitterly cold as it used to be. The first mobile. Perhaps you could remember that. Oh, do I remember my mobile unit? We had to stay at the Holiday Inn. We had to plug it in at night. And one day it was so cold and it froze. The water system froze up while I was at that day working at the stock show. What do you think about all the, the recent proposals to dramatically change the the physical plant there at the stock show? Oh, well, I think the the physical plant is uh, it's old, as you mentioned, yeah, it's, early nineteen hundreds. Yeah, it's old, and it's a very important thing, and it's progressing. Uh, it it's it's gets put off certain parts of it because of. The, trying to get all the political ramifications to agree what's going to happen. But the yards are finished, stock yards are finished, and the livestock situation is about finished. And then the equine thing is supposed to start real active next year. This involves uh, more buildings? Yeah. The only building going to be left is, is uh, well, the Coliseum will stay because that belongs to the city. And the the old arena will stay, but everything else is going to get abolished. And uh, so, it, it, it I think it, it's a it's a big big deal uh, and necessary because it. Well, I forget how many billions of dollars it puts into Denver. Yeah, it's a big contributor. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a huge deal. I hope it all gets together. It's trying to get all of the figures together to get a production. And every year we wait, it gets more expensive. Um, but I'm still an, an emeriti of the board of directors. In in 1950. 1950. Yeah, well, 1946, uh, yeah, six. We were swimming in that pond, and we got struck by lightning. And you were about 13 then? Yeah, yeah. You were in the water? In the water. I had gotten out because I'd had my tonsils out. Yeah. I tell you when I was in 45. I was 12 years old, and I'd gotten out, and I was running across the dike when the lightning hit and knocked me down, and knocked, there were still some of them in the, knocked in there, killed a woman and her little boy, paralyzed my sister, and knocked the other little boy unconscious. Wow. Right there. So this is why you're so crazy today. Yeah. Think like you were hit by lightning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, no, didn't know that. Yeah. 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 Lots of stories. Okay, final topic probably would be your involvement with the Hunt Club. Okay. So think about what you want to say, yeah. and we're well, going to kind of ask I you an open-ended question and we'll let you go. All right. <laughs> well, the history. Well, let's, is probably... let's get on camera first. Okay. But... okay. Are we on? Okay. Um, we're back with Dr. Marvin Beeman, who has a, a long history with himself and his family, his father and his family, with the Arapaho Hunt Club. Tell well, us about that. Okay, well, after Dad went to work there, which we've already talked about, in 1929, and then we moved to the kennels 
1934 and lived in that stone house that's there. And as I recall at that time, it, it had, uh, I think just, just the little stone house. I don't remember that very well. But then they built the kitchen on the south side, or, or the east side, I'm sorry. And, and, then, and then they, and they built two bedrooms on the north side. And of course, I spent my life there from year old till I got married when I was 22 years old and grew up there. We didn't have electricity there till 1946. And the hunt first started there in 1929. The kennels was built, Mr. Fifth built that to my knowledge. And there was one barn there that had had seven stalls down in the bottom part and then a hayloft that was built on the bank. And there's an interesting thing over on the East Ranch, close to Wildcat Mountain, there's a foundation there. I don't know if it's still there or not. It had the same foundation as that barn did. So it must have been a catalog set of you know, architecture somewhere or something like that. But anyway, so I started there in 1934 and grew up listening to my dad who became the huntsman in 1934. He'd been a whipper in from 1929 till 34 and the huntsman that they had just left. And Mr. Phipps came to dad and said, can you hunt down? And dad said, well, I don't know. He said, I, 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 I'll sure give it a try. Who was the uh, master of fox sounds? from the late 20s on? Mr. Phipps was. Yeah. But, and how many members were there? I don't have any idea. Not very many. How many How many horses were boarded there? Well, to start with, there were only seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. And they were all seven Mr. Phipps. Seven stalls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then that barn got converted with six more stalls above it, which made it 13. And then I think in the first the extension was built in 45. Mm -hmm. Mr. Phipps and Dad did most of the moving of the dirt with the Caterpillar from Highlands Ranch. And they built an 18 stall barn just east of the one that was there. Yeah. Was the was the hunt um, in operation during World War II? Yes, it was. Though mm -hmm. Mr. Phipps, I understand, Spent some time with the cavalry in uh, Nebraska. That's exactly right, at Fort Robinson, Nebraska. And they had shut down uh, the Highlands Ranch Mansion building when he was gone. Oh. At that point, but uh, I, but after the war, then I don't know. I didn't. But know after that, the war, then they had the eighteen. Yeah, I didn't, eighteen I didn't, I didn't know they shut it down because well, you, there was some water damage that occurred at this point because it wasn't being heated uh, when Mr. Phipps was gone, from yeah. what I understand. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't, didn't remember that. But anyhow, yeah. you, the people that know about that, I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, the hunt went on when Mr. Phipps, who was the master, and my dad was the huntsman. Yeah. And the my two uncles were his whipper ends. Then when they got drafted, then those two young, that one young lady that's in that picture mm -hmm. and, and her friend were the whipper ends. And then that's when I became the gate boy in, in 19, well, I'd have been, I was nine years old. So that was 1942 and riding a rickery, by the way. And uh, so I did that. And then when the, the lady young woman got married then I started whipping at age 10. I was the youngest recognized whipper in the Masters of Fox Guns of America. And what year was that? That was yeah. one, 1943. Three, even yeah. during the war. Yeah. 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 So I started then and as that picture was taken a little, I don't know quite how old I was in that picture. I was probably Maybe 14. Was that taken for Life magazine? No. That, I've heard that, that story before. 
that there was a Life magazine article. Yeah, it was on the cover of Life magazine. That it was sometime in after the war in yeah. the 40s. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't that picture. No. Yeah. The cover on the Life magazine was taken just north of where the law enforcement target areas is. There's a ridge right there, and it sure. was taken there, and it was on the cover. Mm -hmm. I, the shadow of my horse is as close as I got to the cover of the Life magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and I was on the right side, by the way. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's there was some really neat pictures of the mansion. Have you seen those that were in Life magazine? I think magazine? I have, yeah. yeah I've, at one point. So anyway, I hunted, started hunting then, and then the story about my dad and I do, being very foolish with a coyote playing on a straw pile and 20 above zero and about six, eight inches of snow. We started there from where the law enforcement center is and stopped down right up here by the county line, which was a very foolish thing. Because and this was an exercise the horse it, day on, it, a, on a Wednesday. No, this this was a just exercising hounds. Just yeah. the, there was only two of us, and the whole knew, two of us knew where we were in the world, and that was my dad and myself. <laughs> and if we'd have had a wreck, we'd have just had to r watch ride off and let the other one freeze to death because we'd had to go on because we I think we probably had close to sixty seventy hounds out that day, and. Uh, <laughs> That's the day my mother said she was going to get my sister educated and dad could worry about whatever education I could get. And I went to school. And the teacher said, oh, I wasn't going to have any. I was doing fine. I didn't have a classmate at that stage of the game. I was doing fine. Dad said, good, then he's not going to be here on Wednesday afternoon anymore. He's going to help me hunting. <laughs> so I did that too then. Until I went to high school, I I didn't I had to quit hunting on yep. Wednesdays in high school. Do you, but have, I, do you have a memorable hunt that stands out among all the hunts you've had? Realize you hunt two three times a week in the coldest yeah, eight yeah. months of the year. Well, one of the most memorable hunts I had here was when Lorianne was born in 1960, and uh, we. Uni was in the hospital with Lori Ann, and this was, she was born on the 6th of December, and this was probably on the 8th, and we started at the, at the law enforcement center and came north and started the coyote all up here, just about where Broadway and 470 meet up here. And we started that coyote and went from there to right over to Castle Pines, where he could look down and see Castle Rock. That's a long, that's a long. Hunt. And we galloped from there, yeah. basically, to over there. We crossed the Daniels Park Road. Yeah. We went over there and stopped the hounds over there. And I can remember I told my dad, I'm going home because I need to go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. See my wife and my new, brand new daughter. Yeah. We got home and I think we figured out we'd been about 30 miles. I can still remember back across the Daniels Park Road, and and I, when we crossed the Daniels Park Road first, there was a, a fellow that hunted with it, had been a, a medical doctor for Patton in World War II. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was in he was in his on his major staff in Africa and then in Italy and uh, and in Germany. Anyhow, I told him, I said, Dr. Franklin, if you're going, and he was going to go see my wife, I said, you tell her, I'll get there when I can. <laughs> which, which, That's a pretty understanding wife. <laughs> yeah, you bet. So that, getting back to that, that was one of the most memorable hunts that I remember. What's the, what's the length of an average hunt in terms of time and distance? When I was hunting the hounds, I kept a record. The average time was two hours and 45 minutes, and we averaged going 18 miles in two hours and 44 and 45 minutes. And the attendance there varied, I'm sure. Varied. A couple of times. What was the high point? 105 people wow. were in the field. The number, we had another, but this wasn't on Highlands Ranch, but where we are now, a fella came from Georgia with his hounds and horses and we 
mixed our hounds and we hunted four days. The day we had our hounds mixed, he hunted his one day, I hunted mine one day, and he hunted his the next day. And then we, the fourth day, we mixed them all together. We had, we had, oh, we had thir four, 35 couple of hounds, 70 hounds. And uh, uh, we started a coyote, and a coyote ran. A, we had 10 people, and we had to get to the answer. There were 184 people on horseback. There, there was there was eight of us with his the huntsman from Georgia, and his whipper ends and me and my whipper ends. So there were eight of us in this hunt staff with that many hounds. So there were 174 people in the field, yeah. and we went. We figured we we got done that day. We figured we'd done about 28 miles. So one thing we haven't talked about yet are the hilltoppers. When did that start? How did that come about? Well, I think my mother started that when she decided not to ride the horse back and she followed in the car. And how do they know where to go? Well, she knew Given enough the about the country. Dogs that, may not have picked yeah, up a scent yet. Yeah, well, she knew how to go to the high high places. Uh, and she Rocky Hill was, you know what I'm talking about, Rocky Hill? Mm -hmm. Rocky Hill was one of the her favorite places to go because she could see all of the hunt out around the open area from there north that was one of her favorite areas was to go up there but she she had a knack I, i'll never forget i got hurt and broke my leg once and i had to go hilltopping with her and i was absolutely amazed at what she knew about where to go and so forth and, and she was our ambulance out there when somebody get hurt she'd always come pick them up <laughs> <laughs> the hilltopper grew to how many vehicles? Oh, I know it, it varied. But. It varied, but usually it would be just one or two, mm -hmm. and then sometimes it'd be four or five. The day that I told you about the two hunts were mixed together, there were ten car loads, and this, the coyote that day ran around those cars twice. <laughs> Why? What possessed that cow to do that? I don't know. So here is 184 horses going around the hilltoppers twice. <laughs> <laughs> but, One point here a few years ago, I don't remember who it was, but I, I did an interview with somebody whose parents had been the official photographers. Maybe you know who that yeah, was. Yeah, I can't. Tell think. me if you remember. Uh, I, I do. Yeah, they lived. They lived over here off of Titan Road. And they did most of their photos. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As hill talkers. I can't remember, remember that. He, he, I remember the name right offhand, but yeah, I remember this yeah. was the daughter of yeah, the yeah. parents who were the official yeah. photographers yeah. who were yeah. basically hill toppers. Yeah. yeah. Well, they rode in the field, but they did. Well, yep, they lot, were. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, well, what were their names? He was a pretty good sized fella, and she was pretty small. Yeah. I can't think of their names right now. Uni would know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I can go back and look yeah. at the at the records or whatever for that yeah. but that's good so the hunt club moved in the 80s out to the lowry bombing range and well not at first we didn't we didn't know where to go and we went where did, what, what did you do we went we, we uh, one of our hunt members had a little piece of property on 105 mm -hmm. and we he had a, a small horse barn there and we put the hounds there and we were there for two years and you found coyote there well, we didn't hunt much there. We got the lease on on the bombing range, so we hunted there. But the hounds lived there oh, on one hundred five. Yeah, we hunted. A, well, we hunted a few times there. Well, several times we hunted there and uh, places around there. Mm -hmm. But and, and exercised the hounds down there. So the bombing range, I just picture that as out in Aurora someplace and pretty yeah. flat land. Maybe well, it's it, not. Well, it is. Yeah. It's, and, uh, but you'd, you'd pick up coyote scents there? Yeah. I mean, coyotes live everywhere, yeah. including in our neighborhoods yeah. occasionally. Yeah. It, uh, it was a, It started as, a, as I understand it, as an incentive to get a place so when Larry, to get Larry Air Force Base to come to Denver. It started as a practice at bombing, that's called, why it's called the bombing range. 
I don't know how what size it was when it started, but when, during the war it became 96 square miles. Mm -hmm. And we and got that's where Air Force pilots and training yeah. practice their yeah, yeah, uh, the bombardiers practice yep. the bombing range. Yeah. Um, by the time that you got there in the 80s, uh, had they cleaned up most of the ordnance? No, they spent about 10 years picking up most of that stuff. But, and, you know, they and they found some pretty good sized bombs went off and blew a hole when they set them off, well, probably 10 feet deep, and 10 feet wide. Were there ever any uh, instances during the. Somebody hunt? said that one of the ranchers. Helper blew a front tire off a car, but or truck. But you never had incidents. No, no we we, uh, we didn't have any incidents, and <laughs> the, the the ordinance people that were picking up the, the active material that they, they had practice bombs. They were about this long, and uh, they were made of pretty heavy iron, and but they had a core that had some explosives in them, so they could see where they went. And they had yeah. the fins on them like a regular bomb. And we picked them up. We just thought, you know, we find them. We picked them. We had, we had about ten of them stacked in a window at the kennels where we had the hounds. And those ordnance people drove in there one day, and they saw those little bombs in the window. And they got in their car and went back to the road, main road, and said, "You damn freaked! Yeah. Some of those are still alive." And yeah. they were. We didn't know any better. And, and we found a lot of they, the, the practice bombs were made like stove pipes and the, the the body of the bomb would be about that long and then the fins and we found not a lot of but uh, several laying out there and there even some of them still had some of the sand in them good <laughs> that's good so eventually you built a clubhouse there yeah we did mm -hmm. built a clubhouse we built the kennels first and mm -hmm. moved the hounds off of 105 over there and it was a. It was such a. The first time we hunted out there, I, I'll never forget it. Well, the first day we hunted out there, my dad said when we were going to move, from here, that he was wasn't going to go anyplace else. He was going to retire, he was going to hang up his boots and his cap. And, and what boots. year was this? Oh, that was eighty. That was eighty. Eighty four. Mm -hmm. And then that, that's when then they asked me to hunt the hounds. Well, he didn't, he didn't quit. He, he, uh, but anyway, the first time we went out there, we, before we had a kennels, we met on the, uh, the Elbert County, Arapahoe County line, which is on the south side of the bombing range. Mm -hmm. The first time out there, I said, Dad, you better hunt these hounds, because neither one of us know where we're going, and so I'll whip, and and you hunt the hounds, and so he hunted them the first time. I hunted them the second time, and he got the first tally ho. That's when we see a cat, and I saw him get his, getting his cap off because he'd broken his arm. He had to do it this way, <laughs> and we had to run. And I'll never forget the cat went northeast, and I came over a, a, a ridge, and I looked, and there's space I had never seen in my life, and I thought. What in the world's going to happen when I get over the top of this hill? Yep. And, then, and the coyote guided you, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. That's the beautiful thing about hunting live. You never know where you're going to go. That's true. Yeah. So how often did you, um, <clears throat> you, you chase coyotes all the time. Yeah. I think I remember you telling me the story earlier that all the years that you did the hunt, there was only once that uh, in this three times a week, eight months a year, that yeah. Uh, you didn't pick up a scent. Well, early on, no. But we, from 1972 till we left there, we we picked up a coyote every time. Dad had, and and then then when I hunted the hounds, started hunting the hounds. I did not have a blank day in the 33 years I hunted the hounds. So you chased them often. Did you catch them occasionally? And a lot of people have this misnomer about uh, traditional fox hunting is that uh, you chase to kill. Well, that's how it started 400 years ago or 500 years ago was to yeah. try to keep the predators from killing the calves and the cattle and yeah. the sheep. 
that's how it started. And that's, and that, they, that was the whole purpose of it. Sure. 10% of the time, this hunt will catch a coyote. And out of 80 hunts, you're going to catch eight. Yeah. Well, okay. what's your experience been here at the ranch? You chased often. Do you actually, do you actually catch and kill ever? Oh, 10% of the time. Yeah. yeah. And it's usually a crippled or a diseased one yeah. or a young one. So somebody's got a, He's got a weapon of some type to yeah, put shoot. him out of misery. Yeah, shoot him. At that point. Yeah. Yeah. And occasionally strange things happen, and uh, you, you've talked about being bitten. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> well, we had, we had chased a coyote from where the law enforcement center is. Well, we started it further north, and the coyote went that way. And he got up a, one of those little washouts, and then you know how those washouts are the water does this, and it, there's an overhang. Well, yep. this coyote was up underneath there, and we had the females of the pack out. And he that coyote was a big old dog coyote, male coyote. He was fighting them really bad, and so we thought, well, we and one of the rules is if you corner of the quarry, you're you're supposed to kill them. Well, we didn't have a gun with us that day. My dad said, well, you get off and see if you can hit that cow in the head and kill him. And I, he was that's, under the... That's brave. <laughs> of your dad asked that you... He was underneath this overhang, and I, and there was about this much snow on the ground, and I, I get over there, and I, I looked down there, and he saw me, and he started to leave, and I took a whack at him with a stick and hit him, and I fell down in in this little draw, and the cow rolled down the bank and landed on my chest with his head right there. <laughs> and I thought, if I move my chin, he's going to bite me in the face. So I put this arm up, and he grabbed me right there, and then I was able to dis dispatch him. And I looked up, and my dad was about to die laughing. When I was 45 years old, I said, here I am, about to get killed by a cow, and you're laughing at me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dad. Yeah. And then about two weeks later, we chased a cow through the buffalo pasture. Did I tell you this story? No. Well, we... This is up on Daniels Park? Yeah. And the buffalo pasture is on both sides of Daniels Park. Yep. You, you know that. Yep. Well, they were on the west side. And we had permission to go through there. But we there was no jumps, obviously. That big high fence around there. Sure. Well, we were going straight east. And the coyote went up this draw. And there's a kind of a cliff in there. Mm -hmm. Well, Dad and the hounds went over here, and I started up the right side, and the buffalo were bedded down. And I, well, some of them were on one side of the ridge, and some were on the other side of the ridge. I thought, well, I can ride up there between them. And I started up through there, trotting, and and, um, I thought, and they got up and kind of started moving. Well, looked up, and here came a cow, snorting and wringing her tail after me. Yeah. And, so I thought, you know what, I better get to going as fast as I can go because those buffalo can run as fast as I want. be fast. Yeah. And I did outrun her. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if you don't, you're going to have a hell of a wreck. So here I was, I got bit by a coyote, and two weeks later I got chased by a buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> not very many people in this world have had that happen sure. to them. Yeah. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so the hunt club today, what's your involvement? I'm, I, I became the huntsman, but went from a whipper into the huntsman. Replaced after my, your dad retired? Yeah, after my dad retired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I hunted them for 33 years, and then I retired in 2019. Weren't you also master of fox hunt? I, I, I'm one of the masters. Are master. you an emeritus now? No, I'm still a master. You're still a master. Yeah. I'm Are a, there other masters? Yes, there's three other masters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And? So, How do they arrange who's, well, the huntsman is the huntsman. Yeah, the huntsman is a, either, like I was a honorary, not a professional. Dad was a professional. That's yeah. what he got paid yeah. for. And we, we've had one other professional huntsman, and now we have another honorary huntsman. Mm -hmm. And so... How many members do you have today? We have about 45 and they're active. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, just... oh, oh, we hunt. We had 38 people. Yep. Grand old time. Yeah. Um, I'm on it, your email list, so I see the Facebook postings yeah. or whatever. Yeah. The uh, Often about... The beautiful thing active. about the hunt, as I've already mentioned, was it was such a nucleus for our family. My wife whipped, my kids whipped for both my dad and me. I've got a picture that there's three generations of it in that picture mm -hmm. when I was hunting the house. In fact, it was close to the last hunt we had on Highland Ranch. It was taken... It's taken right, you know, where the law enforcement center is, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know that pile of rocks that's northwest sure. there? It was taken just on the on the north side of those rocks. And I'm in the picture, my dad's in the picture, my, son, my wife's in the picture, my son and my daughter's in the picture, and my sister. Yeah, it's family right. photo. Yeah, it would be a good photo, yeah. Well, I know it's been important to, to your family. It's been important to Highlands Ranch yeah. to know the, yeah. the history of these yeah. things. When I do a tour at the, at the mansion, whatever, I always point out some of the things that mm -hmm. uh, are involving the hunt club. And that's yeah. an interesting story to be told, if you will. Yeah, one of those other little pictures is a picture of my son and there's another one of my dad on a gray mare in the mansion mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. good little pictures yeah okay well we give you the last word at this point uh it's been an interesting couple hours here of you sharing all your memories what else would you like to oh, tell just, us today just about the evolution of this building we're in and the history of the practice as I started in 1957 with two veterinarians and two pickup trucks, Mr. Dr. Johnson had one truck when I got out of school, and I, my mom and dad gave me a pickup for graduation. Started there, three-room office, one secretary, and then we hired Dr. Vale in 1970. No, not, yeah, no, 1960. And then we hired Dr. Swanson in 1968, and then we out we built a small surgical facility at 6221 South Santa Fe Drive. Moved out of the three room office, which became a small animal, not related to our practice. And we had one of the first hydraulic operating tables in the country. A, a, a guy that built veterinary equipment designed a hydraulic operating table. Large animals? Just for horses. Horses, yeah. Vertical, you put the horse up there, strapped into it, and tipped him over and, and operated on. Yeah. And then then we had that, we outgrew it, and then we bought this place in 1972, finished the hospital in 1975, and we went from two veterinarians to three veterinarians to five, and now I just count them to veterinarians, there's 27 of us here. And yeah, I was impressed to see how many offices and people in yeah, these yeah. and computer screens yeah. and everything else. Yeah. So it seems like it's a successful growing concern. Yeah, it is. This right here was a breezeway to this house when we bought this house. And we, we kept it that way for a while. And we had, it had six bedrooms in it. And we had a big bedroom upstairs when my kids and I, did I tell you the story about us moving here? You did. Yeah. yeah, and our daughter slept in that ho that room. That's an office now for the the chief executive officer. And then we closed this up and built this conference room. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, great, great histories. Yeah. So, on behalf of the historical society, I want to thank you for all of your comments and stories. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I sure want to. You to say Highlands Ranch and that environment is what has made horses do everything I've done. Yep. Yeah. So.